to their futures Soldiers speak out Soldiers speak out Soldiers speak out Soldiers speak out Thank you for coming to our presentation today. This is uh, put on by Olympia Movement for Justice and Peace. Uh, along with collaboration with Washington Truth and Recruiting and Coffee Strong. Uh, toward the end of the event, we'll have respective fundraising pitches for all three organizations. If you can contribute money, it would be greatly appreciated, but I would just ultimately like to thank you for your presence here because uh, it's very special. Counter-recruitment is something that is still just as vital today as it was during the W. Bush administration. And um, two doctors from the University of Washington published a very intriguing piece on why this is still an essential issue. They're here today. This is uh, Amy Hagopian and uh, Dr. Amy Hagopian and Dr. Kathy Marker. Um, after their presentation, they will take questions directly after and then we'll bring in people from Coffee Strong who will have to a certain extent a response to the presentation and also explain a little bit, a little bit about Coffee Strong. And uh, then They'll take questions and then we'll have a general question after for all four people. So again, thank you for coming and uh, we'll get started right away. Thanks. Hey, hi everyone. Okay, I'm Kathy Barker and I got into counter-recruiting probably as an anti-war from the anti-war end of things around 2004 and 2005. Amy will tell you a lot more about what some parents did in Seattle about counter-recruiting. So we did this paper. Um, Amy is in public health there. I'm actually not affiliated with the university right now, but we did a paper called Should We End Military Recruiting in High Schools as a Matter of Child Protection and Public Health? This is, um, what was unexpected about this paper is doing it through, I think, an academic venue. It was very unexpected there and got a lot of um, right-wing press because of putting it through an academic venue. And the answer to that we came up with was yes. We, people should try to end uh, military recruiting in schools. The process of military recruiting in schools really resembles predatory grooming. That was one of the main um, parts of our paper, that it's not just this innocent thing like you're soliciting in schools or selling, getting people onto football teams. It's very much the process of predatory grooming. We believe that organizations should all do what they can about this and other issues that involve children's health. And that academics, rather than being in an ivory tower and being separate, really should not hesitate to get involved in social and political issues. So military recruiting in schools changed in 2002. In that year, um, uh, No Child Left Behind came out. And there was a section 9528 in there, which um, said that schools had to give um, military recruiters access to their students in the school and give them their home contact information or, or risk losing all their federal funding. So that changed everything right away. Military recruiters have always been in schools. Some schools let them in, some didn't. But with this rule, now every single public school, not private, Every single public school had to let military recruiters into the school and give them their kids' um, home address information. The good thing about this, and what I have there in blue you can't read, but it's the most stunning letter if you read it. It's, it's, it's a, a letter between Rod Page, who is head of the Department of Education, and Donald Rumsfeld, Department of Defense, mm -hmm. with a letter saying, this is great, we have this collaboration. We need people in the military, now we're in the schools. This is how it was. The military brought this bill up to Congress to get kids into schools, and that's indeed what happened attached to No Child Left Behind. But there was a good thing about this. Well, first of all, what, what it required kids, to, what it required the school to do is to turn over the students' home contact information and provide the same access to students for military recruiters as for other recruiters. So that same access meant that is, if you let college recruiters in a couple times a year, you have to let your military recruiters in a couple times a year. In effect, it's been much, much more, many more military recruiters. Schools don't say no, um, and they're in there much more. They have the access, they have the funds to get into the schools much more than do college recruiters or job recruiters. And this recruiting is, is just really something. This, this is a picture of um, Marines at Garfield High School. We're, you'll hear more about that from Amy, but both of us had children in Garfield High School, which is a large urban high school in Seattle. And this is the Marines coming for a visit. And the Marines come in and they said to the kids, drop, give me 10, and the kids drop down and do it. But it's a very, very, um, it's a very elaborate process that gets these kids in the school and, and keeps the, the military recruiters there with them. And it really does resemble predatory grooming. 
And by predatory grooming, I mean uh, the process by which a child is befriended by a would-be abuser in an attempt to gain the child's confidence and trust, enabling them to get the child to acquiesce to abusive activity. It is frequently a prerequisite for an abuser to gain access to a child. So this is very much what's going on with military recruiting in the schools. This is what um, right-wing talk radio took exception with, but I hope, you can, I hope to convince you that it's really true. This is a real process. It's not just recruiters are suddenly in the school. It, it, it's, it's much more, uh, trickier than that. Some components of what predatory grooming, which is usually associated with predatory grooming for, for, for sexual reasons. That's the usual way people look at predatory grooming. It's also um, used as a term for, uh, for trafficking kids, a lot of things. And some consider it inappropriate that we would use that for the process of military recruiting. We're not saying military recruiters are sexual predators. We're saying the process is like grooming. The components that are similar are, for one, um, predatory grooming, uh, People target the area. You don't just come in and decide you're going to take advantage of somebody. They're very clever. They target the area. They target the victim, victim to make sure they have access and uh, will not be challenged. They engage the victim. This is not just coercion. This is becoming a friend. They engage the family oftentimes. Oftentimes pred um, predators, sexual predators, military recruiters will engage the families so that the family doesn't see any threat. They just see this as another nice person offering things. There's desensitiz desensitization is very important. That's where you get someone to, f to ignore the warning bells that usually go off at something. Most people, with a, with a, if you look at a sexual predator, you've got warning bells. You know that somebody's not supposed to sit that close. You know they're not supposed to be asking to take your clothes off. With desensitization, it's not just the military recruiters. Um, it's, you know, it's kids' entire desensitization to war and what it means to go into the military that's kind of worked with this process of predatory grooming. And last, there's an emotional bond. Um, a, a predator will have an emotional bond with someone. You're in the same club. We can't tell everyone. There's, there's, there may be threats, but usually it's done more with secrecy. We're all together in this very special club, and we don't want to do anything bad about that to wreck this bond that we have. And so the process of military recruiting in high schools also works by gaining the students' confidence and trust to get them to fight wars. And I, I think what gets me very upset about this is that our public school systems are totally collaborating in this by giving access to the students. And their tacit and overt approval of military recruiters is telling the kids that it's okay. It says to them, because they welcome the recruiters, they don't fight the recruiters, they're saying this mission, everything they want, everything they're asking you is okay. Nobody checks up on what they're saying. No one comes and tells the kids what happens to you in the military, at least through the school district. That's what activists do. And one thing that's very bad about this happening at the same time is that the adolescent brain is still developing. We know so much more about the brain than we do than we did know years ago. It's 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 no longer thought that it, it's finished developing in teenage years. It develops till you're 25. This is so well studied. I, I don't even think there's that's controversial at all. And it starts. You start. You have two big bursts of brain development when you're younger. The first in the womb, and then the second as a, as you're a teenager. The development kind of goes from back to front of the brain. And what's really important is that the um, teenagers tend to come to decision making with their amygdala, sort of midbrain, that's the emotional section of the brain. And it's not till around 25, the last section of the brain, your prefrontal lobe, which is your executive function, where you make reasonable decisions, careful measured decisions based on data, that doesn't turn on till you're about 25, especially in males who are a bit slower than females. So doing this in high school, when the kids don't even have the brain power to actually make uh, a measured decision, it's just really terrible. We, we know this about that, and yet we're asking them in the, we're letting the kids go through this in the schools. You say although, don't you think that's why? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt No, you. in my positive spin, I tend to think things sort of happen and, and not on purpose. Okay. I think that sometimes happens on purpose, but I think, you know, people aren't thinking that. I don't think teachers are thinking about the brain. And, okay. But, you know, I'm a glass half full kind of. <laughs> kind of purpose. So the cre recruitment of minors is a, ma is a major focus of recruitment. And I was really interested to see this during the, um, when, we, when we were on radio and discussing with right-wing um, people this, what they kept trying to tell us is that, no, we don't really like younger people at all. Actually, the age is much older than you think. We're, you know, the average age is really 24 or 30. It's, it's not young people at all. We don't care about those. Those are just extra. And that's absolute nonsense. The high schools are a huge focus of military recruiting, absolutely huge. 
Um, this is uh, the school recruiting program. And just let me read you a couple things. This is a book you could find online. It's the Army School Recruiting Program. It's one of the creepiest documents you could ever imagine. If you want to read about how to take advantage of a, of a young person, how to get into a school, how to ingratiate yourself with teachers and counselors, this is the book. I mean, if you're a salesperson, want to sell something, here's the manual. So some of the things they tell that the, the, you can see in this book, <coughs> Recruiters like infantrymen must move, shoot, and communicate. Another, book sa another part of the book says the objective of this program is to assist recruiters with programs and services so they can effectively penetrate the school market. And it's much. And they tell them they tell you how to insinu insinuate yourself in. They tell you go to football games, be a coach. They give you all suggestions. Bring donuts to the secretaries. Tell you all these things that you do. They give you times when when students are more susceptible to recruiting than other times for high schools and junior colleges. You know, this is when the grades come out. This is when people are more likely to want to join. They are competing with kids who want to go to college and have jobs to get them into um, to get them into the military. And so this thing goes through all the different points about where it's best to approach a child in school and at home. And, and it's been, in one way, especially now with Obama, it's been really hard. Um, when people hated Bush, it was a lot easier to counter recruit. It's been really hard to do this because people do not believe our country is militarized. They actually, I think if you were to ask people, do we live in a militarized country, I think most people would say no. I think if you say militarized, I think people picture, you know, the Russian army, or the North Korean army, not us. Not, not the Americans, and they certainly don't believe, I don't think, that their schools are militarized. So it's been, it's been quite hard to um, convince people that actually the steady inroads in the school is something to be worried about. They just don't see it. It's invisible to people. We've, we've been desensitized in the schools to thinking this is a problem. Now, there actually are opt-out provisions. This has been a great thing for activists to get into the school. No Child Left Behind and FERPA, the um, protection uh, laws, do say that you cannot give information, contact information, unless you have um, parents' permission or the students' permission. No Child Left Behind, in fact, says all students can opt themselves out. So this has been something activists has used in this, have used in the schools, because the schools are required to tell students that, but do it really poorly. They tend not to tell the, the, the parents and the students that they, they are allowed to opt out. So this is where um, a lot of us got in there in uh, 2004, 2005, is by handing out the opt-out forms just the regular sanction and opt-out form, and everybody wants it. Everybody that gets that form wants to sign it. We've seen in the schools a steady rise in the percentages of people opting out just by having access to the information that they can opt out. So that's been a really, really important thing for, um, for activists to do counter-recruiting. But there's so many more things that are going on in this school. The, for example, you can opt out of having your name be sent to the military, but we'd hear from parents saying, well, I'm still getting calls at home for this kid, still lots of calls. Well, there's also a thing called the um, JAMRS, the Joint Advertising and Marketing Research and Studies Office, which is the Department of Defense partnership with a marketing agency. They, have, they also are building a database. They build a database from driver's licenses, from, from taking SITs, from just about anything that you sign online, goes into this giant marketing database, which much more information than your contact information. They know what grades you have, how you did here. Uh, medical information, it's all here in the Jammers database, which is then used to contact students. Now you actually can get your name, you can suppress, you, have, you can have your name suppressed but not removed from the list. That's something almost no school um, does. Some schools are starting to develop policies now to let students know that there's this other marketing database that has all their information. We also do work with, where, where we see a lot of stuff is the College and Career Center. And here you can see a little setup of a lot of military brochures. This is how a lot of, a lot of um, college and career centers look. You, you know, you have maybe one-third military brochures and, and, and two-thirds just every other job in college on the earth. What, what we're seeing now in Seattle and other places is that with the budget cuts, we're losing our college and career um, uh, advisors, our counselors. We don't have anyone in the school who is now a gatekeeper for people coming in. So what we're seeing much, much more uh, military penetrance into the schools and very few, uh, you know, as we could see in Seattle, much fewer college and job recruiters. There's nobody coming in for the kids except for military recruiters. And this is really hard this time where military recruiting doesn't get people all jazzed up as it did during the Bush years. It's actually much worse what's going on in the schools now. Another thing you see a lot is job fairs. You know, without counselors, a lot of places have job fairs, and there's always um, school job, school fairs, city fairs, uh, all city affairs, individual schools. There's always military demonstrations there. They usually have some sort of, as they do here, some kind of playing army games 
um, exhibit. And when you sign up, your name then goes to the military. You can't use it unless you give permission, then they have your name and everything. But they're, they're absolutely everywhere in job fairs. One of the most insidious tools in the school is something called the Armed Forces Vocational Aptitude Battery, the ASVAB <laughs> test. This is given to students in about 90% of the schools in Washington and all over the country, the high schools. So how this is marketed, it's a, it's a, it's a choice, it's a test, they, they say, to help you decide what it is you want to do in your life. So it's marketed to students as the Career Exploration Program. Discover yourself the ASVAB. Once students discover what the ASVAB can tell them about their aptitudes and abilities, they will rush out to take the Armed Forces Vocational Aptitude Battery. This test should help them and their parents figure out what, what career directions may be most appropriate. That's from the website. If you go to the website, you don't see anything about the military on the website. It's just this happy little career test that you can take. Well, then if you go to, the, um, according to the Department of Defense, on ASVAB, this is from the Department of Defense um, brochure instruction number 1304, the purpose of the Department of Defense student testing program are to provide the military services with access to the high school market and recruiters with pre-qualified recruiting leads. This is what the ASVAB is about in school. Yet it is, you know, if you go to a, um, any kind of teacher's fair or something like that, someone's marking the ASVAB. The counselors like it because it's free, because usually career tests cost money. This is a free test, and so they like that, that you can get some um, advice for your students without paying a huge amount of money, something that's really important. They're kind of forgetting the part where you, the military now has your name. You actually do have options not to have your name sent to the military. You could take the test um, and not have your name sent to the military, and really this is a valid career test. But the schools don't tell students. Very few schools tell students that they have the option to say, take option eight, which says my, my information will not go to the military. This is something else that's changing. Now, Maryland's, the state of Maryland recently passed a law just last year saying all students who take the ASVAB in public schools have to take option eight. Their, their information will not get sent to the military. And the Department of Education of Hawaii made the same rule. So slowly schools, only, uh, only under activists pushing, 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 slowly schools are changing the rules so that if you take this test, your name will automatically go to the military. At the least, what people are pushing for is to let parents and students know that this is going to happen, because most of them don't even know. Another thing that you have in schools is Junior ROTC, the Junior um, Reserve Officer Training Program. More than 3,000 schools have it, and there's more than 500,000 kids enrolled here. Now, they, the military says with this as well that this has nothing to do with recruiting, but it's something like, I believe, close to 50% of the kids that will go into the military. So they're doing drills. They get teachers that are not uh, certified teachers in the same way the other teachers in the school are. And the town that, that brings them in also has to pay, which is something they don't understand up front. Another thing that goes on in the school is the Future Soldier Program, Delayed Entrance Program. A lot of the students in the schools are signed up before they graduate, before they are 18. With a parent's signature, they can join the military um, at 17. And they actually get bonuses if they get a friend to sign. So depending on the branch of service, they may do nothing. They may report on weekends. But uh, another, so that you've got a lot of this future soldier stuff going on um, in the schools. And schools also don't tell the kids that if they change their mind, that they do not have to go to the MEP station, the processing station, and they'll just be free of, of the burden of being in the military. You can walk, you can get out of this very easily, and they don't tell them. And in fact, some of the worst cases of um, recruiter impropriety are about this, where they actually, and for example, they caught a guy, I believe, in Houston, in Texas, threatening somebody, saying, if you don't do this, you're going to get arrested. You've signed this thing that you've got to go, and you're going to get arrested. It was, it's, and the teachers and the schools push this because they don't actually know what the rules are about this. So, I mean, I, it's, 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 it's absolutely endless what goes on in the schools. There's vans, helicopters, climbing walls, video games. We, it's, a lot of times this, the, um, the military will come in a Black Hawk helicopter and land at the school and bring all the kids in to see the helicopter. And if they sign in to go in, they get their names. It really gets kids pretty psyched up. Um, people stop that. They tried to bring one to Rainier Beach High School in Seattle, and some of the teachers and parents and students got together and stopped it. Same thing on Bainbridge Island outside Seattle just a few years ago. So you can stop these things. Um, the vans don't come anywhere around here anymore. They skirt around Seattle and go up to the other side of the lake because they know that activists will come and complain about the big vans that come with army games inside. Of course, you've got online games all over the place. And in fact, there was um, something called the Army Experience Center in Philadelphia. A lot of the places closed down. The recruiting stations combined to make one mall store, which was basically a video game store, a video game center. Everybody would come in and play video games, and that was the recruiting station. 
um, they got kids. It was very effective, but that got closed down by activists. It was easy to target, and they closed down last year. This, this game I've showed you is actually kind of interesting, because, and I don't remember the name of it, but some kind of activist was able to get online, and every time there was a dead body there, he put the name of an American soldier who actually had been killed. He was trying to make people understand that this isn't just a game. And so he was able to hack on there and have these names pop up with the names of people who have died. Um, we, we found at one time that military recruiters actually being invited to Seattle park events. And we found out because um, a parent complained that one of the community centers during spring break for a middle, middle school son, the um, Navy and Army recruiters were there for the kids there, getting to do climbing walls and getting their signatures. Um, at, the, at these events, these community events where parents were sending their kids to be safe during spring break. The Blue Angels is, everyone in Seattle loves the Blue Angels, and this, this is a huge, <laughs> well people feel very special about the Blue Angels. If you, if you look at that, on the website of the Blue Angels, Blue Angels is all about recruiting. That's why they do the Blue Angels. It's one of the most powerful recruiting tools there is. Everybody gets so excited seeing the Blue Angels. So if you look at their site, they break down what's going to happen. If you raise the money and it costs thousands of dollars to bring them to your town, there's a whole list of recruiting events that are mandatory. You've got to have this many teachers, you've got to go to this many schools, you've got to have this many influencers, teachers and other people who influence youth, who are going to be part of being taken up on rides. It's a whole program that goes into play for the time after the Blue Angels that are in town. So this is not about air shows, this is all about recruiting. And I mean, it could go on and on. There's ads on TVs and movie theaters. Um, you've probably seen some of the National Guard ads in, in uh, movie theaters. On cable and public schools, I found out near here in Grays Harbor, I think it was, Gig Harbor, they, were, they have a public access television in the, in the students in the school, and they were doing military commercials um, through all the commercials during the kids watching those supposedly public TV during schools. Sports, sports, and sports. Sports events are so tied up with the military. They sponsor a lot of the, the um, interstate sports events around. There's some places where the schools are so hard up, they're giving naming rights. So you may have the Army strong weight room and things like that. Um, they take kids to games. It's, it's, it's pernicious. There's constant mailings to home. People always have, get many things at home. Whenever you see them, you get jackets and swag and hats and, and key rings and all sorts of presents. Influences are taken on trips. Influencers that said our, our parents or teachers or someone, uh, scout leaders, someone has a huge influence on kids. They're given special three or four day junket trips where they take them to the military base, run them through a little kind of soft um, base camp to try to convince them why the military is a really good option for kids and why they should convince kids to go on these, on these trips. There's also, and it starts, it's not just starting in high school. More and more we're seeing recruiters on the military getting into the younger years. Um, so we have a star base program, there's one in Washington, where they go, they take kids and bring them to the um, Air Force bases for science programs, for example, that's, that's star base. There's a National Defense Cadet Corps, which is something like junior ROTC, except that none of the, um, the money is paid from the Department of Defense, it all comes from the town. You've got military public schools, Chicago has six military public schools, run like charter schools, but they're actual military public schools. And we have a school here on the Kitsap, which is a, um, a National Guard school for kids, they say at-risk kids. It's basically run as a charter school um, where they take at-risk kids, get, give them a, a GED if they want, and I guess something like 40% of them go into the military. So I'm going to turn it over to Amy now, and she's going to look at what, what local people can do to try to handle some of this. It's okay. Yes. Yeah, so... Uh, I can just use that. Sure. So, um, back in the day, I had a bunch of kids, and uh, they went to public school in Seattle. And uh, when they got to Garfield High School, um, I was fairly active in the um, parent association, and um, uh, it was about the time when we were thinking about invading Iraq for, for, I mean, that was so long ago now, it's hard to remember that, um, that there was a time before we had invaded Iraq. Um, I have a picture of my now 19-year-old daughter wearing a Don't Invade Iraq t-shirt when she was just a little kid, and, you know, it's kind of hard to remember that. but. So this is the Garfield High School logo. Uh, the um, bulldog is our mascot. Uh, 
anybody familiar with Garfield? It's sort of an iconic school in Seattle, about 1,700 kids, um, about 42% white, uh, quarter black, um, the rest Asian and Hispanic. Um, it was the first uh, magnet high school in Seattle intended to uh, move towards um, voluntary desegregation and sort of well known for that. Um, and of course a lot of famous people went there like Jimi Hendrix and Ernestine Anderson and Quincy Jones and Martin Luther King spoke there when he did his one tour through Seattle uh, in 1961 and Barack Obama spoke there in 2006. And our PTA actually staged an event at his talk because it was a uh, pro Maria Cantwell rally, actually. Uh, and our PTA held up anti war signs during that talk, which was not very popular um, among the Democratic Party operatives who were there. Um, so it's a history, it's a school with a lot of history and a lot of soul, and uh, it was probably a good place to try to do some of this activity um, and see where it took us. Um, in 2002, as the school year was starting, uh, it became clear that uh, there were forces mobilizing to invade Iraq, um, which indeed occurred in March of 2003. But we passed a resolution in the fall of 2002 opposing that invasion as a PTA. Uh, and uh, it was it received fairly broad support even though it seemed like an issue a little bit far afield of our mission um, but uh, the resolution that we passed said the lives of the young people we graduate from this institution are valuable and precious to us the financial costs of fighting a new war will come directly from the public's resources that would be better spent improving the quality of education for our children and advancing their opportunities for higher education. Um, so even though that was such a sensible resolution, we invaded Iraq anyway. Uh, and so after that happened, the recruiters were all over the schools recruiting in a fairly aggressive manner. Uh, and I actually think the recruiting that goes on in Seattle is pretty tame compared to the recruiting that goes on in suburban and rural schools. So what we were seeing was just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so our PTA put on a forum uh, for the school community uh, assessing uh, this recruiting situation. We invited some speakers, we talked about the issues. And as you'll recall, the don't ask, don't tell issue was still very hot at the time and uh, became sort of a front and center argument for um, opposing uh, military recruiting in our schools when the military had this extremely discriminatory policy that was not consistent with any of the values um, of our public schools. There were also reports at the time of large numbers of rapes of young women, uh, potential recruits. The AP put out a story saying over 100 young uh, women had been raped by recruiters. Um, and so our PTA took a vote on this in May of 2005 and voted to oppose all public school-based uh, military recruiting, um, including in our facility. So uh, that very week after we passed the resolution um, was scheduled another big recruiting event in our lunchroom. Why do you suppose they recruit in lunchrooms? Middle of the day, lunchroom. Who's in the lunchroom at lunchtime in a public school? Students. Students on free and reduced lunch. So kids who can't afford to go across the street to the uh, food places, and those are the kids who are the best recruits. Um, so I showed up at this recruiting event. Um, let me just skip to this one. We can come back to that if we want. And uh, tried to inform the recruiters that they were no longer welcome uh, in our facility. And the press appeared at this event, and then all of a sudden it was just this huge uh, uh, amount of media attention to this. Um, television stations showed up, 
Um, lots of radio talk shows, uh, both right-wing and progressive, um, and all around the world, Japan, Germany, um, all sorts of places were interested in this story. Um, I mean, I basically had to put my job on hold to respond to all the media attention on this. Um, I was PTA president at the time, and so I was the spokesperson for all this. Um, so that was sort of what the parents were involved in. The kids as well, um, students themselves uh, had opinions about this and did their own political organizing around recruitment. Um, so uh, later in 2005, um, there started to be student walkouts uh, around the war in general and recruitment in, in particular. We went from opposing uh, military recruiting in schools to working specifically with our school board to revise the rules around which people recruit. Um, and our school board ended up adopting some of the most progressive uh, recruiting parameters in the country. And uh, our, um, those regulations are up on the web and have served, uh, I think, as a model for other school districts seeking to limit recruiting. Um, we have rules like um, recruiters can only come once per semester. Uh, of course, there are many branches of the military, so if each branch of the military gets two visits per year, that's still a lot of military visits. Um, you know, it's kind of like saying the University of Washington can only come twice and not saying the English department, the math department, the um, computing department, and so on each get to come. So it's, it's sort of interesting how we parse this. Um, we also spend a lot of energy uh, going to uh, water, water, Washington Truth and Recruiting, spend a lot of energy organizing people to go to uh, parent open houses in the high schools to distribute those opt-out forms that Kathy talked about. So we used that opportunity as a recruiting tool to talk about the war and about recruiting in schools as well. But even as we were passing these stricter rules on recruiting, the recruiters find very uh, ingenious and creative ways around the rules. So. Uh, as part of the budget cutting in Seattle, we lost our yellow school bus transportation for high school students to get to school. And so they were all put on public metro buses. And the recruiters realized that's a great opportunity. They can ride the buses when the kids are on the bus in the morning and in the afternoon and sit next to kids and recruit them on their way to school. Uh, so they don't have to use up a whole semester visit on that. They also started advertising in the school newspapers, so they would take out these full page um, ads to uh, attract kids. And then we uh, were able to uh, place ads of our own, so we purchased ads. This was a great boon for this school newspaper. Uh, so we purchased ads opposing um, uh, young people entering the military and pointing out the um, hazards to that activity. Um, we think this is a public health activity, so uh, as a faculty member in the School of Public Health at the University of Washington, I felt this was um, a hazard to young people's health and used the opportunity of um, uh, having the American Journal of Public Health as a venue for publishing this sort of paper. Um, the issues around the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, the bad health outcomes for young people who enter the military, all those are good reasons um, to oppose young people entering the military. Um, everybody aware about the UN Protocol on the Rights of the Child? The U.S. and Somalia are the only two countries that have not signed the main protocol. Um, although we have signed uh, some of the riders, it's sort of an interesting thing. Uh, and one of those um, is an optional protocol that says persons who have not attained the age of 18 years are not compulsorily recruited into their armed forces. 
and it ensures safeguards for children subjected to voluntary recruitment uh, in underage settings. So we feel that that uh, UN protocol is severely tested when uh, recruiters are in high schools where kids aged 14 to 18 are present and they are clearly reaching out to the young kids. These are, you know, I mean, we talked about predators, but it's, you know, I mean, the cigarette companies know you got to reach young people before their brains are fully formed and able to make good decisions, and uh, the military knows this too. Um, in our review of the literature, the Army and the, uh, well, mostly the Army, but uh, various veteran services have done some pretty good research on the health outcomes of soldiers and um, uh, recruits and uh, have found that the worst outcomes are for the youngest people in the military. And uh, so, for example, the highest rates of all mental disorders, including alcohol abuse, anxiety syndromes, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, are among the youngest cohorts, aged 17 to 24. Um, younger soldiers had 30 to 60 percent more substance abuse disorders than older soldiers. Younger women, in particular, had the highest incidence of attempted suicide or self-inflicted injuries. Uh, youngest groups of veterans also recently experienced a 26% increase in suicides from 2005 to 2007. So these health outcomes indicate, you know, I mean, when you look across the board at population health, youngest people tend to be the healthiest people. Uh, and so it's, it's unexpected to find these very bad health outcomes among the youngest people in the military. Um, so, uh, Kathy already talked about this whole brain development issue, but um, this particular quote from a researcher at the University of North Carolina I think is important, and he says, the most potent predictors of why adolescents engage in all kinds of health risk behaviors, substance abuse, sexual behavior, even recently self-cutting, is very much related to how much they perceive that their close friends are doing the same thing or someone that they consider very cool and popular is doing the same thing. Uh, and these uh, risky behaviors have some lifelong consequences. And young people living together in these uh, settings where they influence each other's behaviors and um, create these situations where um, these risky behaviors are going on um, is not a good thing. I think everybody's kind of aware about the whole issue around the poverty draft. We, we I mean, when I was a kid, we had the real draft. And uh, when they wanted to have a war in Vietnam, they had to draft lots of ordinary people, including uh, middle class people and people who would really rather have not gone. Uh, and it's probably why the war didn't last longer, because if you have a citizen draft, uh, you really have to sell a war to the populace. And now that we have a poverty draft where it's just kids from the South and poor kids who go, um, and that is the predominant group in the military, really. It's um, families with traditions, and it's people without choices. Um, then you can carry on these conflicts, I think, without really having to sell them to the public because the, the general public doesn't have their kids in these wars. Um, so why should academics and scientists get involved? I'm not sure we need to sell that to this uh, coffee shop audience. We prepared this paper for our University of Washington colleagues. Um, when the when the paper first came out, um, it was interesting the response it got. It was mostly uh, of interest to right-wing radio talk show hosts, and uh, Bill O'Reilly got a hold of it and trashed it on national television, and that brought attention to us. Um, and uh, you know, University of Washington is very sensitive around these issues, and. Um, they weren't particularly happy about that, I guess we should say. So uh, the UW did have a press release around the paper, and they yanked it after the Bill O'Reilly flap. Um, 
And I guess this is just more along the lines of what uh, Kathy was talking about, but um, you know, these are cheerleaders on an army bus uh, after a football game. There's just so many ways in which um, the, the military is finding an insidious way into our schools, and parents may or may not even be aware of these things. Um, but probably there needs to be more auditing and monitoring <coughs> around this. And people need to talk more about the war with our kids um, and the cost of the war, um, which is excessive. And you know, you think about what we're doing right over here, cutting $5 billion from our state budget. And we're doing it with, what did the Senate decide? A 3% cut to teacher salaries? Because they're already rolling in it, right? Um, I mean, these, the, the war is having direct consequences on our state budgets at this time. And nobody's connecting these dots. So um, we encourage people to get involved. There's some great materials out there. Um, this is a nice piece. Um, who published this? Quakers. Um, so Sergeant Abe goes through the recruiting contract and explains what the small print means. But there's a lot of good kid-friendly uh, material like this. Um, a lot of good resources so uh, and do we have these slides up on the website right yeah yeah uh, so our paper is on the website and these slides are on the website um, and we can give you that link if you want. so you guys want to come up and talk about coffee strong <laughs> Quickly through the Bill O'Reilly period there, um, were there some serious academic response? Was there time for one? Um, what what else had you hoped for that might happen with it? Or is there still potential to get it out? Um, it's a lot of effort to have Bill O'Reilly kind of step on it. I guess there's a short answer and a long answer to that question. Um, when our PTA first took the stand against military recruiting, uh, that was when I got the most press attention for our activities. And at the time, uh, I came under a lot of scrutiny from my university. Um, and I was, I was easy to find on the internet, so after every press appearance, I would get a lot of email. I ended up printing out all this email and it fit three binders. Um, and during that time, uh, somebody filed an anonymous complaint with the State Ethics Board about my use of email. It was actually the public's use of email to me. but um, And it took a year and a half to resolve that complaint through the university, which hurt me. Uh, and so this time, um, it wasn't as bad as that time, although it, it was really unfortunate that mainstream media did not take any interest in this paper or in our findings, and that only right-wing media were interested in it. Um, but we, we have had some, uh, for example, a historian came, a, a, a young guy who's doing a graduate degree in education and history. He had written a similar paper to, to this with, with the same idea. And we just heard from a physician who wrote a paper in a medical journal that came out a few years ago advising physicians to take these kind of uh, bad outcomes for, for youth in mind when they're doing physical exams and counseling kids. So I, I think there's a good side of it and that, that I think people, at least academically, are finding each other who have had the same idea over the last few years. Um, I did hometown recruiting. That's what you talked about earlier. And basically I had to go home for, I basically got asked, do you want to go home for two weeks and hang out? And I, did, I think I had to do a little bit of work for my recruiter, but I didn't do too much. I don't know if you had a similar situation. I didn't have to do anything except for show up at the high school once in my military uniform. That's pretty much, yeah, I didn't do much more than that. But. Um, um, right now, one of the things that's, that's really amazing to me is, is, a, is a teacher now, I teach sixth graders right now, and um, even at that young age, it's really amazing to me to see how kind of militarized our culture is. Um, 
I have kids, sometimes I'll come out, I'll mention that I was in the army, and kids will ask me the, the most weirdest, most bizarre questions imaginable. Usually kind of dumb questions like, have you ever killed anyone? Like things like that, which I guess would be somewhat predictable. But one thing that's really interesting is kids will ask me about weapons, and they'll actually like know the names of like weapons and like nomenclature. It's really weird to me. And then I'm asking them like, how do you, how do you know this sort of things? And it's like from video games. So like they, they play Call of Duty all day. So they, they're asking. So they know what kind of weapons that people in the military use and like what they're called. And it's really bizarre to me to to, to meet 11, 12 year olds who are aware of this, but it's it's not surprising either. Um, there's also um, even in schools, you know, which is which you guys talk a lot is there's this like direct correlation between schools funding being cut and the amped up the um, and militarism in this country being amped up. And um, schools are very much complicit in it. I've seen last time, my last student teaching experience, I was at a school and I sit through like a Veterans Day memorial, right? And to me, it was the most bizarre thing in the world. I didn't want to participate in it because, not that I'm, I'm against veterans, but just I don't think that, I think that celebrating veterans, but not celebrate, but not, but also not acknowledging the victims of the occupations is horrible and wrong. You know what I mean? Because even during this, even, maybe Joe can agree with this too, but I went to Iraq for a year, and you went twice, I think. And my, my time, my, my experience in Iraq was very, very short compared to the people who live there day after day after day. Any, any post-traumatic stress that I suffer is very little compared to the people who live in our occupation. So I think it's horrible that you know, schools don't acknowledge it. At the same time, as a teacher, that is something that we can use, that you can bring up, is that you can try to kind of flip the script and actually try to have students look at look at war from the, the position of the people who are on the opposite sides of that. And the, the thing about it is that if you join the military, you're basically joining one of the biggest organizations of bullies on the planet. You know what I mean? That's straight up what it is. You know, um, most of us, I think most, a lot of young people, they, they join the military with this idea that we're gonna go to war and we're actually gonna, we're gonna somehow stand up to the bullies of the world. That we're gonna do something good. No one joins the military with, I don't think, with these with with like um with with basically bad intentions for the most part most people i think join with good intentions what what happens unfortunately is that like for me and maybe for joe and other people is that you know um i grew up watching like documentaries about world war ii and seeing like concentration camps liberated i get to iraq and i basically work at a concentration camp you know what i mean i get to iraq and i'm not you know, I'm not like fighting against oppression, but I'm pretty much going on patrols with like openly racist, you know, who basically view every Iraqi as somebody being guilty because of the color of their skin. Uh, and I have a soft spot for vets as well. Um, so I don't want to go so as far so far as to say that recruit, and I think you articulated this well, that it's not necessarily military recruiters that are predatory, it's the system that's predatory. And I really want to make that clear that I don't like to use the term predators to describe them, but I think the system is definitely predatory. Um, and that's only because copy strong. Uh, we have we try to be really strong in our message that we're pro-soldier and we're anti-war. Um, so we do a lot of stuff for soldiers, but we also have no problem talking about how we're anti-war with soldiers. And we definitely have no problem coming out and speaking to students about that either. Um, usually, whenever I go into a classroom, I don't tell the cl I don't tell the students don't join the military. What I do is I tell them that right now you're 18 or 17 and you have no idea what you're getting into. You don't understand geopolitics at all, and that's not taught to you in high school. Um, and the recruiters certainly aren't gonna talk to you about that either, because their job is to get you to join. So to go and describe like the period from 1991 till 2003, under which, or uh, in which um, Iraq was under UN sanctions, and like 500,000 children died as a result of that, they're not going to tell you that, those sort of things. Um, so anyways, I just wanted to, I wanted to get into something really quickly because I wanted to talk about how like absolutely accurate you were and some of the descriptions you gave. Um, so you talked about the DEP program, delayed entry program. I was got, I got into that and I actually was given, I was given E3 status. So you start as an E1. I made two extra ranks and got extra pay by bringing my friend in the military. Um, they did the exact same thing with me like right before I joined. They had me and bring my friends into the recruiting office and they had us doing push-ups 
um, for pizza and for different things. So like, I out push up all my friends. So I got like a full, like a like a large pizza to myself, which is sort of backwards, right? Like you're really healthy, so let's make you eat an entire cheese pizza. Hey, it was one of those friends in my platoon. James Bucket, yes. Okay, this is a really weird story. I got, I'm, not, I'm sorry for interrupting you, <laughs> but this is a fucking. It's a really small world. So there's this dude in my platoon that I could not stand for the life of me. Everyone has a story, right? He's just super annoying dude. Coincidentally enough, he was friends with Joe in high school. And he's the guy. He's the guy that I recruited to get into the military. So, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Joe. <laughs> no, my experience in Iraq was so much better thanks to you. And now, and now, and actually, now I have like serious guilt because that guy came back with PTSD and then dated my oh. sister and was verbally abusive to my sister, which is not funny. But my sister was verbally abused by this guy who had PTSD, and now he like lives alone and he has no job and he's on disability. So. Like, like this whole terrible circle, which is tragic between Josh and I in an ironic, maybe funny sense, like full circle is actually a terrible, horrible story of exactly what happens in the military. Um, he has PTSD and a bunch of other injuries. We can give them a, a real idea of what war is like. I remember the military a while back came out with a, a counter counter recruiting tool where they would have like speak to a soldier online or hear soldiers online. They'd have. Private Joe Snuffy, that's what we call like just a generic private name. They have Private Joe Snuffy on like the Army website and they could go there and they could ask them a question or watch a video where they would ask questions like, what's war like? And Private Joe Snuffy would be like, well, most of the time it's boring and sometimes it gets bad, but I feel, you know, I feel safe with all my armor and everything that the Army gives me. And so I can go in there and say, well, actually, uh, war is essentially a series of like a long, like long boring stretches punctuated by sheer moments of terror. Uh, and this is what it's like. Um, and then I usually bring in, I have a piece of, a chunk of shrapnel that landed like three feet away from where I slept. And I'm like, I carry this around as a good luck charm because this is the, this got really close to killing me. And they're like, oh, let me touch it. And then we have, it sort of opens up this discussion. And so rather than saying like, don't join and trying to be this authority figure, I really try hard to give them the opportunity to understand what the experience of war is like. And I also try to do like sort of history lessons um, recently I was asked to speak in a classroom about the Egyptian Revolution. And so I talked about the Egyptian Revolution, and then sort of talked about foreign policy, and then I got around to the fact that we were giving Mubarak like $2 billion a year. And all of these kids in this high school class, they're all ninth graders, like, why would we do that? Why would we give them $2 billion a year? I thought we were trying, we were the good guys. And I, and I said, well, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes we do, do the good guy thing, and sometimes we do the bad guy thing. And in this case, we were doing the bad guy thing. And then I can have an opening where I say, okay, so if you join the military, one thing you're gonna be doing is you're going to be helping enforce these policies. So even if you disagree politically with this policy, which in fact I think is really important about being pro-soldier anti-war, essentially what we're saying is we support soldiers who made this decision and who genuinely for the most part in good faith think that they're doing the right thing and genuinely feel like they're helping us. And I know that's hard to believe looking at Iraq, but I think a lot of soldiers, I know I did, like I totally bought into it. I was like, I'm helping out people that I love, Americans, right? They, um, they join in good faith sign up for the military service, and then if you find out that you disagree with it, which is something that happened to me in 2003 after we invaded Iraq, you're kind of stuck unless you want to go AWOL. You're stuck in the, in the, the situation where you, even if you disagree with the policy and think it's a bad choice, there's not really much you can do about it. So, hey, we paid Mubarak $2 billion a year. Uh, if something like this happens in another country, like in Iraq, say, and they're trying to fight off uh, uh, an authoritarian dictatorial regime, like the Coalition Provision, Coalition Provisional Authority, who we were, that was the military government that was in charge of Iraq for a long time until they got their constitution. Um, you're going to be in charge of like enforcing this. Um, so <clears throat> I think these are like really some of the ideas that you guys have, like having a counter recruiter come in, allowing them limited access. That's a really good idea too. Um, at my high school, we had recruiters in the lunchroom all the time. So exactly like you talked about. In fact, they came and like hung out in our classroom sometimes. The, the, I remember when I got hooked, I got hooked in chemistry class. They came in and gave a PowerPoint presentation. And I really liked CSI back then. And they were like, you can be a military police. I sort of see myself as being very much the archetype of the student that you described uh, who's getting victimized. I don't consider myself a victim, uh, but I know that there are many people who were. Um, I'm from the South. Uh, from I was born in Tennessee, but I was raised in Missouri. Um, 
my whole family has a history of military service. My father, his father, my mother's father, my mother's father's father, all the way down the line, lots of military service. Um, I was not able to afford to go to college. My dad wouldn't pay for it, my mom wouldn't pay for it, and I wasn't able to get scholarships because my parents made just enough money to not, so that I couldn't get it. So I, and they used all the same techniques. And so we get around to the back end, right? They, you, they've got you in, they've done all the grooming, they, and then you come out the back end. And what we see at Coffee Strong is pretty much the back end. And what you see with Josh and me is pretty much the back end too. So you've got like these potential pros and cons that come out of military service. Like the, con, the, pro, the pros are like college benefits, healthcare benefits, um, decent pay, job training maybe. I have a friend who's making $140,000 right now in Afghanistan. Um, you can help the people you love if, you know, if you're doing that in good faith. And then you have the potential consequences, which is what we see a lot of at Coffee Strong. You have uh, like one third, uh, one third of all women who enter into the military service are sexually assaulted. Um, my wife is sexually assaulted. Plenty of women I know were sexually assaulted. Um, usually that involves alcohol and substance abuse is a really is a regular thing. You've got PTSD. I had a soldier, actually, funny story. A soldier come in the other day, totally pro war. He sits down. He says, "So, what did you get your? What did you get? Like we were talking about the GI Bill, and I and he said, "So, what did you get your degree?" And I said, "Middle East studies." What are you going to get your master's in? Because I mentioned I was getting my master's and said terrorism studies. And he's like, so why are you in here? I guess he assumed that terrorism studies meant that you automatically like want to work for the CIA. And he's like, so what are you doing here? And I said, what do you mean? Well, it's anti-war. And then I looked over and he's got like a cup of free coffee and he's using our internet. So we start having this conversation, conversation. And then finally he goes, he gets around to saying, hey man, I got PTSD. Um, can you help me get disability benefits? And I was like, what do you mean? I'm, what am I doing right now? Like, I'm in here exactly for this reason. Because you, as pro-war as you are, you went to war, got recruited, all this other stuff, and now you're sitting here asking me how you can get disability benefits. And another part of the back end is you have problems with like homelessness, and we get so many homeless vets coming in and out. Dennis is dealing with a homeless vet right now from the Vietnam War era, who still hasn't got his benefits. He lives like on the streets in Seattle. We have, uh, we have all over next to the military base, homeless veterans. Um, you've also got mental illness. Um, I have a soldier right now who's coming in pretty regularly who uh, has a uh, mild traumatic brain injury, has trouble sleeping. Doctors can't, oh no, he had trouble sleeping, now he sleeps too much and the doctors can't figure out what's wrong with him. Um, today I spoke with a woman who had a C-section three years ago and uh, still has pains and the doctors can't figure out what's wrong with her and she's preparing to get out of the military. So she's asking us how to get military disability benefits. And we've also got soldiers who are dealing with the, you know, the fact that they went to war and came back and had mental problems. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but JBLAM, uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord, is the most troubled base on the West Coast. Awesome. So when we get to like the health hazard issue, I'll, sorry, I'll wrap up. The, the thing is, what I'm trying to get at is that you're incredibly accurate and like what Coffee Strong's doing right now is like hitting up the back end. We're trying to take care of that, which is making up for the fact that all of these recruiters are coming to the high schools without soldiers or without recruits and teenagers really understanding what they're getting into. Like, they don't know the full effects. Like, we have this myth of a volunteer force. I didn't know what war was like until I went there. Until I went to Iraq in 2003, I had no idea. I thought I did. Black Hawk Down, I thought, was like a pretty good description of it. And then I got there and I was like, man, the heroics, there's no heroics about this. It's just awful.